Evcol. Evcol Entertainment presents The Countess. Now, one can talk forever and ever about how wonderful a place is, about how bubbling brooks glide over smooth, water-worn rocks, and how the throffing torrent dances in swirls, how there are fields of lush green grass, flowers of all the colours of the rainbow, and bunnies that bounce through fields of lush golden corn. However, we're going to skip the more flowery chatter and get on with this story. For those of you who think this yarn comes from my own mind of a thousand thoughts, you'd be wrong. I stole it from a chap I met in a cheap vegetarian diner on the other side of the moon. This guy, Big Ron, once a boxer and now a mechanic for an intergalactic trucking company, was sitting alone as I entered the diner, which was less than clean and called Café Blue. There were no free tables available, so I seated myself next to him. Although there were knives and forks available, he gobbled his food with his hands with no regard for personal hygiene. So, I ate in silence, occasionally wiping my face as splatters of his spaghetti sauce landed on me. After a short while, Ron turned to me and we struck up a conversation. He asked me what I did and I told him I was a writer. Ron told me what I should be telling were stories of bravery, adventure and heroes of bold. I tried to tell him that the book I'd just written was full to the very brim with such things. But he wasn't having any of it. So, there I sat as Ron began telling me about the land of Zumbug Munchieville and the tyrannical countess who once ruled there. As he spoke, I soon realised that he did indeed have an interesting tale to tell of bravery, daring feats of daring things, worms and cabbages. But more of these later. As we take you on a journey to the kingdom of... Zumbug Munchieville was a quiet little place Fields of corn, green meadows And a smile on every contented face Land. No EU regulations or interfering government hand. People of this place they lived in Sumbug Munchieville was its name. The babbling brook consoled the weeping willow. Lovers look into each other's eyes and cool. Like Batuk, the soft for his pillow Yes, Zumbug Munchie fills a place where dreams come true But, as with all the good things in life this was not destined to last After a long illness the king, whose name was Reg Tinker though the courtiers called him King Spondacious Rulus Us Wellus sadly passed on The queen, who was tired of all this ruling decided to leave the running of the fair kingdom of Zumbug Munchieville to her eldest son, Rupert. Meanwhile, off she went to run a well-equipped sports shop just below Marshmallow Mountain, which was the best skiing spot for miles. Rupert was popular in Zumbug Munchieville. Attractive heir to the throne, mind of his own and strong of will. But Rupert had this hankering to see the world and know its secrets Know its people, everything. The prince, not wanting to leave the kingdom without a ruler, asked his cousin, Countess Minty Ball Zhang, to sit on the throne whilst he was away and look after things until he returned. Now this countess was a brusque and moody kind of dame. Minty by nature, in fact Minty Ball was her nickname She had such vile, putrid breath That the plants and some small animals spelt death This is how she acquired her name, Minty Ball From the mints she quaffed non-stop to make her breath kinder The Countess wasn't well liked in Zumbug Munchieville And for good reason Her father had died many years ago And left her his vast estate of mint mines you see, the rock upon which the kingdom of Zumbug Munchieville is built is what everyday mints are made from. 
and this forms the basis, along with farming, of the kingdom's very healthy economy. If for too long the prince had left to find the thing he sought, and Minty Bull was never one for doing as she ought, she made so many rules and taxes misery was all her reign had brought. She even took away everyone's television so they couldn't watch their favourite soap, which, she said, was dumbed down rubbish. Can you imagine how the people of Britain would react to that? Even though the prince had informed Zhang that she was only there to look after the kingdom and not to make any new rules, Zhang ignored this. The first thing she did was to reclaim all the farmland which had once belonged to the old king, but which he had given to the people so that they could earn their own livelihoods. Half the people who had once worked as farmers were shipped away to the new mine, which Zhang had been secretly developing. In this mine, the people were made to dig and crawl until they found... Cabbages! That's right! Cabbages! Zhang had been talking to a ruthless commodities broker in London who informed her that there was suddenly a new world market opening for the vegetable. Zhang, being the greedy little opportunist she was, decided to take this guy's advice and open her own cabbage mine. So, when the prince asked her to keep the throne warm for him, she saw it as the perfect opportunity to make people work in her latest enterprise and take full control of the kingdom before the prince returned from his childish jaunts. Anyway, the prince had been gone for quite some time now. Zhang and he had made an agreement, stating that if he did not return to Zambag Munchieville within six months of his departure, then Zhang would take full control of the country. Well, the six months had passed, and no one had seen hide nor hair of the prince, which, on first appearances, meant that the countess now rightfully became the ruler of the land. So, the fate of the people had been sealed, and they were now forced to work in Zhang's mine. The farmland went to waste and became overgrown. What had once been a kingdom which was as democratic as you could hope for, even with all the pitfalls that can lead to, became a dictatorship. And even worse, ruled by horrible, big Zhang, who is getting uglier by the day. She even sprouted warts on her nose, which had small tufts of hair growing out of them. And her breath was more rancid than the sourest of milk. Quite revolting, really. But this isn't a lesson in personal hygiene. Rather, a story about heroics, free speech, and the right to wear frilly white dresses if one wants to. Now, I must introduce our hero. Barry Braithwaite was only 11 years old. Barry was lovely, kind, and all the things a good son ought to be. So were his parents, Neil and Liz. They'd run a fruit farm on the outskirts of Zumbug Munchieville before Zang had forced them to work for the minimum wage down the cabbage mine. In the early evening, after his unpaid internship at the mine, Barry stood in the rotting orchard and thought... Sometimes in the early morning Sometimes as 
children dragged the heavily laden carts filled to the brim with plump, juicy vegetables to the surface. Here, they tipped them as carefully as they could into carts, which took them to the palace. Every day, Barry tried, when he could, to make it to the orchard, which had once been his parents' livelihood. He would weed and prune, but it was no use. The farm orchard was now overgrown and laden with rotten and useless fruit. All the citizens dreamed of changes, but most began to think that they'd never escape from this seemingly endless nightmare. This was not a thought shared by Barry. He knew his chance would come to make things right, whatever it took. Now, it was on a Monday, not too long ago, that this wish came to fruition. That evening, he and his parents, Liz and Neil, were sitting down to their meagre meal when there was a knock at the door. Mr. Braithwaite cautiously went to answer when in burst four guards and grabbed hold of both him and his wife. The Countess wants you to work extra hours in the mine, boomed one very unpleasant looking man. You both have to go back there, right now. But... Mr. Braithwaite began, but before he could continue, he was ushered out with his wife and into an awaiting cart. One of the ruffians remained, not to look after Barry, who was underage and would legally need supervision, but to finish off the supper, which Mrs Braithwaite had spent so long lovingly preparing. There is only so much that one can do with cabbage goulash, but Mrs Braithwaite had done wonders with what little she had. The guard, being the unpleasant individual he was, with little thought for others, or any true understanding of what was really happening in the world, hoovered up two of the dishes of goulash. Then... Just because he was nasty, he peevishly tipped the one remaining bowl, meant for Barry, onto the floor. Before the boy could get to it, it seeped through the floorboards. The guard just stood there and laughed as Barry tried to save his evening meal. He only managed to save one leaf, which he was about to eat, when it was snatched away by the reptilian brute. The man then raced out of the door to get a lift back to the castle with his mates. Barry's head dropped into his hands started to weep. They'd say that I'm a crazy dreamer for even having these dreams in me, maybe. But I won't give up. Easy. However, just as the first crystal clear tear was about to drop from his eye, he suddenly raised his weary head as a thundering sound could be heard from under his feet. Not believing what he just heard, Barry listened again. At first, he heard nothing, thinking that it had just been his imagination. But as he rested his head in his hands, the thundering sound began again. In fact, the sound was not only louder, but made the Braithwaite shack shudder like nobody's business. Barry grabbed hold of the table as the thundering became louder, and then it happened. The table leg broke off in his hand. Typical, Barry muttered to him. 
himself, but his thoughts were interrupted as the thundering became more deafening until... The floor burst open, sending pieces of splintering wood everywhere. Windows smashed and the furniture broke into a million pieces. The devastation surrounding Barry was incredible. Only a few moments ago, he'd been sitting in the middle of his shack, watching a nasty guard eating the only morsel of food he was going to get that day. And now this had happened. Just when he thought the situation couldn't possibly get any worse, he turned around and came face to face with... Frankie Worm! Who was huge? Huge, meaning that this once ordinary, soil-slurping worm was now over seven feet tall and had a cheeky, rosy face. Frankie took one look at Barry and frowned. I hear your name's Barry, Frankie chuckled. Who on earth called you that? Barry gulped and cleared his throat. My mum? Oh, Frankie began. I was going to say something witty about that name being a little old-fashioned. But as it was your mother who gave you the name, I won't say a word. My name's Frankie. Frankie slithered over to what remained of the only mirror in the house and began to admire her reflection. Mm, What do you think? Something off the shoulder? Or a full-length number? Nothing in the world can beat trying on new clothes The feeling as the cool fabric fits only grows and grows You do up the final strap of it You feel the silky nap of it Lush! Plush! Your carnival and Hogmanay and Mardi Gras rolled into yeah, one. A thing, hush, no, but a right shush. Now. There's nothing finer in the world, I suppose, than stepping out in brand new clothes. This I'll maintain till the day I die. Just you wait and see. Garment therapy is the remedy. You'll be glad you chose. But you don't have a shoulder to wear something off. Harry rightly pointed out. Spoil sport, Frankie groaned. I guess it'll have to be that full length number after all. Where's your wardrobe? Satin slips, silk replies, in light it shimmers in air it sighs like a dream Wardrobe's over there. Barry pointed to a tree some 60 feet away. Well, let's go and find me clothing I can wear. There must be something she can stylish going spare. I know you're her, but what's it going to do? Just you wait and see a wardrobe symphony all fitting gloriously, picked by me with care. Thanks to you and your dramatic entrance. Well, Frankie began. It wasn't me who dropped the cabbage goulash through the floorboards, was it? I mean, there I was, happily slithering home after a hard day soil munching. And suddenly, a whole torrent of the stuff came washing over me. So? Barry was puzzled. Young man, Frankie said, waving a finger at him. Worms don't usually have fingers. Or arms. Or legs, for that matter. But somehow, she had grown two arms during her previous brief explanation, and therefore the aforementioned could happen. This is what is becoming apparent in young people today. They obviously don't read enough, or use their imagination, concentrating instead on social media. What you need to do is to peruse a few rip-roaring adventures where just about anything and everything can happen. Is the lecture over now? Barry sighed. Yes. But I'll continue anyway, Frankie replied, perching herself on what was left of the old sofa. In Zumbug Munchieville, the worms are very special. Now, we may look ordinary, but should any of us come into contact with cabbage goulash as I have just done, then we turn into bigger worms and can speak. That's pushing things just a little too far, don't you think? Barry noted. Maybe. Some of the best adventure stories ever written have some sort of twist like this. If they didn't, then you wouldn't have the help you need to release everyone from the mine. Barry smiled. You mean, 
I can become a hero. Frankie looked him over. Well, she winced. With a little work and a lot of imagination. I suppose you could be considered a hero of sorts, but don't expect anything too grand. Barry thought this over for a moment, although he really wanted to wear a cape and tights, just like the other superheroes. He reluctantly agreed that with a body like his, he hadn't been to the gym for a while, and his rather boring earthly background, there wasn't really much point in him expecting anything too much. Anyway, putting this aside, what Barry and Frankie had to do right now was save the day. So how are we going to save the day? Frankie asked, grabbing a dress from a nearby tree and ripping out the shoulder pads. Well, Barry replied, what we must do is storm the castle and get the Countess off the throne. Which won't be easy as she has a huge bottom. Uh, To do that, we will need an army of some sort, Frankie replied as she tried on her new trouser suit. Which fitted like a glove. We have to get rid of her once and for all. Barry continued sounding all hero-like. How exactly are we going to get this army together? Frankie mused. I mean, Zhang's guards are rough. I don't want to put a dampener on your plans. But storming the castle is all well and good. But for now, and forgive me if I can't see any others behind the trees, there's only you and I. Unless... Barry suddenly clicked his fingers. We feed all the worms we can find with cabbage goulash and use them as our army. Frankie was speechless for a moment, but then a smile started to spread across her face. You know, that's not such a bad idea. Barry puffed out his chest in pride. Frankie sighed. Good, but not that good. Barry let his chest sink and then raced outside. Where are you going? Frankie shouted. Not to get more cabbage leaves. You get the pot boiling. We're going to need lots and lots of goulash. I hope this works, Frankie muttered to herself. You can't just feed us worms any old slop. I mean, it must be just right. You know, it's a real liberty asking us to help. After all, we've spent years being trodden on by humans, cut up in medical experiments, eaten by small children. The list is endless. Still. In for a penny, in for a pound. I'm game for a quest. I just hope the other worms are. Meanwhile, a few miles away... There was a puff of smoke on the horizon, and before anyone could say anything clever, the smoke drifted to the front gate of the castle, and as the dust and grime died down, a strange lady stood proud and erect with suitcase in hand. I want to see the Countess. She announced. Now. We're going to be here all night. You've got the feeling that you've seen me before. You've never seen someone this fabulous walk through your door. Well, let me tell you, baby, I'm the answer you've been praying for. The name is Ermintrude, Ermintrude Mintz. You can see why we'd be here all night with a name like that. (laughs) Give me a mince. I've come to fix your problems, I'm your last chance soon You need my help, lady, yeah, you need it soon It just so happens I come with a fabulous tune The name is Ermintrude, Ermintrude Vince I don't need any of your help, so you can shake your sweet booty right out that door Snapped Zang, adjusting her gusset. You don't know that over the horizon there may be trouble ahead. If I were you, I'd keep my eyes on everything this sassy queen has said. And in the meantime, in your remaining queen time, I'd like to think you and me could be friends. A little quid pro quo, I've got.
Santo. You want a profit and you want it quick. I think I'm starting to get what makes you tick. I'll make your cabbage mine me so much money. It'll make you sick. The name is Ermin True. The name is Ermin True. Don't forget it's Ermin True. Everything you've learned. Show them that the worm has turned. So I suggest that you pipe down and pay full attention to what I'm about to say. Barry's mother and father have been taken back to the cabbage mine to work extra hours there. This is not on. Yeah, you know what? You are actually right. or no relevance to this story, a man called Egbert von Winkelstrasse had decided that the work of William Shakespeare was irrelevant and had no greater place in history or our educational system than the work of Ethel Dingbat, an elderly lady who was currently residing at the Summerfield Old People's Home. Although Ethel had been writing for many years, she had never found a suitable publisher for her efforts. 
her greatest work, which Egbert thought divine beyond recognition, was that of an ant, which crossed Ethel's path in the games room one sunny afternoon last August. The story had to be read to be believed. Ermintrude had asked to see the infamous cabbage mine. She was most shocked when she saw the dreadful conditions under which the people were working. When you work for the countess down the mine, you forget your dreams, you cross a line. You're a number, a cog in her machine, and the guards are the nastiest you to have seen. Improve when you work for the countess, the countess down the mine, had the you bright your idea dreams, you cross a line. To You're a number, a cog in her machine. Each day and the guards are the nastiest you have seen. Right. Zero hour contracts, 90 seconds for a toilet break, and no pay during the 15 minute lunch allowance. Sounds like an online retail warehouse. To take things one step further, count us minty, forget your dreams. You cross the line, you're a number of light in her shoe, and the guys are the nastiest you have seen. she was taken along one of many long tunnels to a small office. There she was introduced to the most obnoxious and revolting woman she'd ever met, other than Zhang, of course. The woman's name was Jane Stevenson, and she oversaw the mine. She was dressed in a crushed linen suit, wore a large white hat, and drank copious amounts of Zumbug slings, a sort of cocktail, every chance she had. Now. It was clear to Ermintrude this woman didn't like her. But she kept her cool and listened to Stevenson's continual barrage of derogatory comments, which sounded like those of a repressed fishwife who really wanted to be a singer at the Royal Opera House. Why are the people working so hard? Ermintrude asked with concern in her voice. Because I tell them they have to, Jane replied curtly. And because Lord Snuzzlebucket is having a feast tomorrow night and needs uber quantities of cabbages. They've become something of a delicacy, you know. Ermintrude ignored the false bravado in Jane's voice. But they're just cabbages. You're obviously out of touch, Jane snapped. Cabbages have become the finest food for those who can afford them. They have replaced even caviar as the food of the super elite. I think you're deluding yourself, Ermintrude replied quietly, thinking to herself that these people were indeed as terrible and horrible as she had thought they might be. But again, she said nothing and just nodded. I'll show you the mine and you can report to me on how we can increase productivity, Jane ordered. Ermintrude stepped forwards. I'd like to see the mine for myself, as long as that's all right with you. She gave Jane the biggest smile she could muster, which must have been big, as it worked, and Ermintrude went off to look around for herself. Little did the guard know that as she walked by him, she lifted a key from his pocket, the key which opened the locks on the chains which the workers were forced to wear. Meanwhile, back at the castle... Quiet! For goodness sake! It's Countess Minty Ball! Zang! Lord Snuzzlebucket slithered into the throne room. He was one of the few courtiers that Zhang had retained. Anyone who spoke against her had been booted out. Zhang was, as always, sitting on her throne and pulling the leaves from a cabbage, which wasn't as perfect as the rest. The Countess looked up from her thought-provoking task and sneered when she saw who it was. Oh, it's you. Have you got my money? She bellowed at the small, plump, sweaty man who was wearing a terrible designer suit which he'd picked up in East London on his last trip there. Countess. The snivelling wretch groveled. I have your money all counted and ready to give you, but only when I get my delivery of juicy ripe... How dare you imply that I am not the most honest person that you know? Well, to be honest... Lord Snuzzlebucket, or Snuzzy, as his friends called him, began. Enough! Zhang interrupted him. 
She began to walk down the small set of steps upon which the throne was placed. As she reached Snuzzy, who was grovelling as low as the lowliest of royals, she prodded him with her pudgy finger. Just you remember who's boss, Sonny. You'll get your cabbages, and when they're delivered, you'd better make sure you have the cashola. I don't give the merchandise away for free, you know. I understand, Countess. Snuzzy grovelled as he backed away and practically crawled through the door as he left the room. Yes, the Countess sneered after him. Just make sure you do. Lord Snuzzlebucket raced out of the castle and down the road to where he lived. What a repugnant, odious little twerp. It was then that, much to Zhang's amazement, Ermintrude burst into the throne room with a can of mint fragrance air freshener. Bring a little sunshine, the breeze those smells away. Take out all the garbage, make it new today. Soon you'll come to love it, bright and white and clean. See what I mean. Webs from cupboard and from shelf. Soon you'll feel cleaner. You'll feel cleaner in yourself. You'll lose the smell of rats. We get rid of all those fleas. Air freshener, please. Cleanliness is a habit. That becomes one when one has self-pride. Dirty corners in hidden places shows on the face we show the world outside. Don't take my word for it. To see is to believe. That nasty smell gone. We'll all be able to breathe. Home is where the heart is. Yours wasn't very clean. But now you've got a throne room fit for a queen. But I am clean, Zhang said very defensively. It was at that point that a fly, which had been lodged just behind her back tooth, decided that it wanted to leave home and start afresh. It buzzed right out of Zhang's mouth. Ermintrude just gave the Countess a smile to end all smiles and replied, Yes, <laughs> how right you are. Anyway, I can't stay here and chatter on. I have to come up with new and interesting ways of increasing productivity. Music to my ears, Zhang replied. And with that disagreeable thought in mind, we move swiftly back across to the woods to our heroes, Barry and Frankie, to see how they're getting along. Barry and the worms were travelling across country to Castle Mint as fast as they could. There were no major roads for them to walk or slither along due to government cutbacks and dubious reallocation of funding. So it was taking them some time to get to the castle. Comes a time when words must turn to action. Comes a time when it's do or die. Comes a time when you can't rely on the help of others to try. On your wits alone you must get by. Gotta keep on striving. Show a bit of determination Till you find that you're arriving At your destination Gotta keep on going Give it grit and perspiration Till the end you want to show Namely liberation But Barry, we've got to find a way through these woods Gotta put one foot in front to the other We'll get through these woods pace by pace Gotta look trouble in the face Plus the woods give us thinking space We'd never start if we never left first pace. I don't want to 
stress you out or anything, but have you thought about what we're going to do when we get there? Gotta keep on striving, show a bit of determination Till you find that you're arriving at your destination Gotta keep on going, bring about a conflagration Till the end you want to show me that is preparation Stop, Darling Wood. Now, Darling Wood was a place where old writers, singers, actors, poets and other creatives ended their days as trees and pestered other poor souls who just want to go there to relax after a hard day's work. They included the jaded Arthur Hardwood Fantasticus, a Calypso lounge singer who decided to take an early retirement from the luscious Lazy Lizard Lounge and live out the remainder of his days singing to those who were willing to listen. The trouble with Arthur's songs is that they tended to be rather negative, which is not what you want to continually hear when you're trying to unwind with the Zumbug Sling. What's the point of being racist when life's a pain for everyone? We might as well all try and get along Life's hard enough, all said and done See that bloke, looks like he's happy He's racked with existential pain Doesn't matter what your colour is For all of us, for all of us, for all of us Life is a pain That's a terrible outlook What about springtime, bank holidays and falling in love? Oh, I dream of falling in love. But there's a girl down the mine, and she's determined to shatter the glass ceiling. But those nasty guards won't let her because of cold and safety. What's the point of being sexist? We all get stitched up in the end. We might as well all stick together. At least that way you've got a friend. We must try for equality. Or pay for woman and for man. Cause most of us all get paid peanuts And have to scrape by best we can So you're saying we should put aside our differences? Yes And fight for equality for everyone Regardless of religion or colour or gender? Yes And come together under the banner of how miserable life is?
I, I couldn't. Why not? What have you got to lose? Or you could just sit here complaining about everything that's wrong with life. You're right. What's the point of sitting bitching when there's a world out there to shape? There's so much wrong and so much broken. I'll go and find the cellar tape. The sun started to sink and there were only a few hours left before nightfall. Barry walked away from the others to the edge of Darling Wood, where he could see Castle Mint in the distance. He knew it would soon be time to leave the now peaceful woods and tackle the grotesque Countess. Frankie noticed the young boy alone and slithered up alongside him. Second thoughts? Second thoughts are natural. It only shows you're human. After tonight, things may never be the same. I've had 
had plenty blown in mine along the way. It's true. Looking in the Inside the throne room, Zhang was in the most frustrated of moods. She had been visited by one of her secret agents, who was disguised as a tangerine. The orangeness of the man's disguise was blinding, to say the least. What do you mean he's escaped? Zhang shouted, but then quietened down when some of her courtiers passed by the door. Zhang smiled an insipid smile at them, which would have sent even the smallest child running. The secret agent looked back to Zhang, and after watching to make sure there was no one else around, continued, The prison guards don't know how it happened. One minute he was under lock and key, without a hope of ever being able to get out, and then the next, well, the next, he was gone. Well, how could you let this happen? Zhang snapped. I have just gotten used to ruling this place, to have my cousin, who's supposed to be on a quest somewhere, rock up and ruin everything. But maybe he won't. Come back! The secret agent piped up in a hopeful tone. Oh, idiot! She snapped. Of course he'll come back! To claim what's rightfully his! Uh, but, Countess! The secret agent began. You said that if the prince did not return to the kingdom within six months, then you'd be the one to rule the land! Listen, Buster, let's get a couple of things straight. Number one, I prevented him from returning to Zumbug Munchieville, so I'm out on that count. And secondly, I am not really the ruler of this country, because I haven't been crowned. It was then that Zhang clicked her fingers and pulled on the cord beside the throne. The cord told the courtiers that the countess wanted to see them. Toot to sweet. I've had a hard life. Everything I've had I've worked for and there is no one gonna take it away. I pulled my way up from the bottom of the pile to get to where I am today. Teasing. It has come to my attention that there could be an imposter among us. Now this imposter wants to threaten my succession and sully and defame my honourable name. But I have a plan to kick him back where he belongs. Show him the two and play this game. Cause no one's gonna knock me down. No I have consulted with my advisors and it has been decided that I should no longer be called Countess Minty Bullzang, but Queen Humbug. This will be implemented immediately with a small ceremony to take place in two hours' time. Go and get the bishop, go and get the courtiers, go and tell the people they'll soon have a new queen. Everyone must see it. TV coronation. Go over to the cabbage mine. Set up the big screen. Well, you wouldn't want ordinary people missing out on work or my coronation. Can't have our cabbage economy going into recession, can we? We're gonna do it right. I will be queen tonight. And we can do it by the letter of the law.
of laws, it was polite rather than one of heartfelt conviction. Therefore, I decree that the Bishop of Zambag Munchieville be called. We must make the whole thing proper and above board, Zhang roared, and everyone but the secret agent left the room. Zhang sat on her throne and sighed. She caught sight of the one other person who had also remained. It was Ermintrude. Zhang smiled. In a matter of hours, I shall be queen of this land, and it shall be written that after the crown has rested on my head, no one shall be allowed to challenge me. What do you think of that? Ermintrude smiled a small smile at Zhang, took a couple of steps forward, and bowed. We'll see. Zhang looked at Ermintrude again and wondered where she'd seen this face before. She turned to her secret agent. I want you to find out more about Ermintrude Mintz. Find out when she was born, where she comes from. I find her very suspicious, yet familiar. Yes, Countess, the secret agent grovelled. Queen! Start calling me Queen from now on! Zhang snapped back and then booted him across the throne room floor, out the window and into the garden fountain. Go! Zhang shouted out and then returned to the single thought preoccupying her mind. And that was about becoming Queen. Frankie had reached a small township to one side of Castle Mint. There, the worms split into two groups. One to go off and free the workers from the cabbage mine. The other to storm the castle and get rid of the Countess once and for all. But as Barry, Frankie and the other worms all took deep breaths and prepared themselves for the task at hand, it suddenly dawned on them that something had changed. There were more guards around the castle than ever before and people in the streets were being searched and questioned. Something felt quite wrong. Barry managed to grab hold of a small woman who was walking down the road who screamed and almost jumped out of her skin. 
It was after Barry had calmed her down and explained that he was in fact the hero of the story and wasn't trying to get fresh that the woman told them that the Countess had heard that there was an imposter in the castle who was going to reveal themselves as the real prince and take the throne away from her. Zhang had decided to make herself queen of Zumbug Munchieville before sundown and have it written in the statute books that no one could contest her right to rule ever again. Barry and Frankie then realised that their quest was even more important than they both first imagined. We'd better get everyone into position as soon as possible, Barry suggested to Frankie. Frankie nodded, but then pointed out, How are we going to get into the castle? She cast her eyes over the steep sheer walls, which seemed impregnable. Barry leaned forwards from their hiding place, and he too could see that the task of getting into the castle was going to be a difficult one. It was then that a rip-roaring idea came to him. He turned to Frankie. A catapult! He announced. What? Frankie replied. A catapult! We'll use something strong and elastic like to catapult us through the air and right over the castle wall. Frankie just looked at Barry for a moment with a blank expression. But what do we land on when we get over the wall? She asked, being very sensible. Barry was quiet for a moment and then clicked his finger as yet another idea came into his head. Worms! I don't have worms! Frankie said indignantly. No! Barry suddenly stood, but was quickly pulled down again by Frankie, who could see the guards coming their way. Will you just be quiet for a second? Frankie scolded. As soon as the guards had passed by, Barry turned to Frankie again and explained. No, you don't understand! Barry continued. We'll use one of the worms as a catapult. Then we'll catapult some of the worms over the wall, as they're much stronger and bouncier than humans. Then the others, and me, can be catapulted over and use the first lot as a cushion to land on. Then we can race to the castle gates, open them, and everyone from the cabbage mine can help us. It's a pretty long shot, Frankie admitted. And not one that I'm too confident will succeed. But I'm game, so let's get on with it. Have faith, Barry said, giving his new friend a gentle pat on the shoulder. Now... Which worm are we going to use as our catapult? None of them were interested to start with. The very thought of being stretched and stretched and then let go, not just once but twice, was not high on their individual agendas of lifetime ambitions. But after a fine and rousing speech from Frankie, a worm called Fiona eventually stepped forwards and agreed to be the catapult. They sneaked out of the township and to the other side of the castle. Whereas luck would have it, the wall was slightly lower. They found two trees and tied Fiona to both, being careful not to make the knots too tight so that when she catapulted the second load over, she could quickly untie herself and fly over with them. Again, a difficult thing to do, but one that could be achieved with high levels of concentration and precision. They stretched Fiona back as far as she could possibly go and then the first lot of worms climbed aboard. Then, on Barry's signal... When the guards were out of sight, the catapult was let go and a hundred huge worms were sent flying through the air. Everyone outside the castle was quiet for a moment, hoping that those inside were okay. Tension built up as Barry, Frankie and the others waited, hoping that at least one of the worms would show their pink heads. Time was ticking by. The bishop had arrived at the castle already and was preparing for the ceremony. Then they saw one of the worms waving to them. They quickly made a soft bed for Barry to land on. The others climbed into Fiona's catapult and they were ready to be shot over the wall. As Frankie gave Fiona the signal, she let go and she, along with the remaining worms and one small hero, was sent hurtling over the castle wall in a sight which had to be seen to be believed. stretched and straining who can you turn to to fetch the glue when you're stuck in the dance and you're feeling lonely when you're left in the cold by the one the only person who likes you what can you do just
When you're stuck in your castle and though it's quite grand, life hasn't worked out quite how you planned, then you get a sign. Things will be fine when you start everything that you touch turns to gold. Everything that won't sell turns to sold. But then one day, all that's gone away. Just remember it's never too far gone to change the person you are if that's the thing you Standing on more solid ground You gotta boing Get over yourself You're doing it for the good of your health If you can find your boing today Ain't nothing gonna stand in your way If you're gonna find it You can't worry what they tell you People gonna bring you down Just dust yourself off Shake yourself down Standing on more solid ground You gotta fight Lift yourself in the air You don't know all the possibilities there If you can find your boy today Then nothing and no one will ever again Stand in your way Barry and Frankie landed safely they and the others then scurried off into the shadows so as not to be seen. So, the heroes were in the castle and things were moving along as they should be. Exciting, isn't it? Now, back to the worms at the mine. When the other party of worms arrived at the notorious cabbage mine, they were about to attack in an unthoughtful, ruffian manner. But were stopped by a prim and erect lady hiding behind one of the rocks. Psst. She called. Over here, I'm Ermintrude, and I'm here to help. They moved closer to the woman, who quickly grabbed all 100 of them and pulled them out of sight. Which was just as well, as at that very moment the guards came around. Ermintrude turned to them. The guards come around every ten minutes, she whispered. We cannot be seen until we have managed to secure the mine and take over the office, where the odious James Stevenson is no doubt lurking. The name of Jane Stevenson, who was known throughout the land for her nastiness, sent a shiver through all of them. But this couldn't be allowed to stop them. I have stolen the key to the handcuffs and the ankle chains. Ermintrude informed them. Together, we will help these poor people escape. Barry and Frankie are already in the castle, I hope. One of the worms informed her. We were assigned to bring everyone here to help get rid of the Countess as soon as possible. We have to act quickly. Ermintrude continued, looking at her watch. The ceremony will begin in less than an hour. After she has made herself queen, she can do what she likes, and we have no chance of ever returning the kingdom to what it was like before all this nonsense. How do you know so much about this place? The worm asked. Our informants told us that you come from a place far from here. Oh, there are many things you know little of, Ermintrude assured her. But, more revelations later. We must free these people first and get to the castle to help Barry and the others. And with that thought in mind, Ermintrude quickly told the worms what to do. They all raced into the mine and quicker than quick, the guards were overthrown. Ermintrude moved swiftly to where Jane Stevenson's office was and burst in. Don't get head up, why bother? I know your game, your number and your time is up, so sling your hook, Jane. Work, 
want you. <laughs> then we'll soon be on the run. You've got nowhere to hide. You're just a drunken has been who picked the wrong side. Jane went to pick up the phone to call the guard, but Ermintrude pulled the phone's cord out of the wall before she could. time was running out, they left Jane's office, satisfied they'd had the desired effect. Ermintrude quickly replaced the wig and left the mine to join the others. They all raced towards the castle. Were they going to be too late to stop Zhang? Or were there other forces that would help them with their quest? Meanwhile, back at the castle, Barry and Frankie split the worms into four parties, each with a plan of the castle and the location of the throne room. They were to meet there in 20 minutes, but no one was to enter. The ceremony was going to take place in 30 minutes, so time was running out. It was as Barry and Frankie crept along one of the corridors that they came across the room where the bishop was preparing himself for the ceremony. Barry turned to Frankie. I have an idea. He whispered. But we have to get the bishop. Frankie nodded and then, along with four other worms, burst into the bishop's chambers and gagged him before he could utter a single word. The others managed to get to the gatehouse and battle with the guards, who mostly ran away as they weren't used to seeing giant worms in designer clothing. A few did put up a brave fight, but it was soon clear that the worms were a lot stronger and more versatile than the guards, who hadn't had proper training anyway and were more like playground bullies. The worms managed to gain control of the gatehouse, and just as they did so, Ermin could be seen on the horizon, followed by more worms and the workers, who had a grim look of determination on their faces. It was a look that would have put the fear of goodness knows what into anyone who crossed their path. As they marched, others joined them with pickaxes, shovels, and other such dangerous looking implements. Soon, there were a huge number of people and worms converging on the castle. As they entered the courtyard, Zhang raced over to her window and saw what was going on. She almost choked on the cabbage leaf she was chewing and raced down the throne room as quickly as she could. Go and get the bishop, go and get the courtiers, go and tell the people they'll soon have a new queen. As she ran, followed by the few guards who'd remained with her, she shouted as loudly as she could. Get me that bishop! I want to be queen tonight! I don't care what the masses think. I'm going to be queen of this land. Do what I want, wear what I like, and there is nothing that can stop me. The Countess had ordered that the bishop be brought to the throne room. She also commanded to bring what remained of her faithful courtiers to the ceremony. So there could be witnesses to this rather splendid occasion. The bishop was dragged in unceremoniously and pushed in front of Zhang. At the same time, the courtiers were ushered in, including Lord Snuzzlebucket with his wife. A kindly soul who was getting a wee bit sick of her bossy husband's antics. There was going to be trouble. As the last of the courtiers assembled, And as the guards were closing the throne room doors, they were suddenly besieged by worms in designer suits. The guards went all out to stop the worms breaking through, and in the nick of time they managed to push the doors shut and lock them. 
No matter how hard the worms pushed and shoved, they just couldn't break through the very thick doors. Ha! Zhang shouted. They'll never be able to get through. Get on with it, Bishop, and don't dilly-dally around with all the boring stuff. Just get to the bit where you say that I'm queen. Uh, but I must perform the proper and full ceremony, Countess. The bishop informed her. Otherwise you can't really be queen. Just get on with it. Sneering, Zhang turned her head and looked longingly at the crown on its plump red velvet cushion. <laughs> It's Queen Humbug, you flatulent fatalists! The banging at the door continued, but alas, the worms could not get in. Time was running out. It was then that Frankie had an idea. What about Darling Wood? What about it? Well, I've heard there's this entire country that's powered by moaning. It's called Britain. I went there once on a compost chewing spa weekend. What of it? Well, if they can power their whole country with misery and moaning, think about what all that negative energy could do to these here throne room doors. And what's that got to do with Darling Wood? Remember our pine needle pal? Our evergreen essay? Arthur? Now he was pretty negative. Exactly. He's outside in a pot, complaining his root ball's too tight. Just go and get him. In a flash, the worms brought forth the potted Arthur Hardwood Fantasticus. Ah, uh, hello Arthur. How are you? Not too Oh, much. I'm sorry I asked. We've got a rather special task for you. You see, you need something stronger than those doors to take them out. But what if you channeled all your feelings about the world into one laser beam and trained it on those doors? Could you give it a go? I suppose I could. Here goes. What's the point of ever smiling when no one ever smiles back? Has that made the slightest difference? Not the smallest little crack. Keep going, keep going. What's the point of being happy? When the world's a place of pain And most of all the people in it Only have a tiny brain What's the point of liking people? All they do is let you down So there's not much point in smiling You might as well stick to a frown that much misery. What's the point of being born at all when you're only gonna die? That's it. Come on, Arthur. What's the point of having birthdays? What's the point of having Christmas? What's the point of having chocolate? And with that, the throne room door splintered. Arthur couldn't help smiling. In fact, he positively beamed from ear to ear. I've done it! I've made something happen! Meanwhile, inside the throne room, the bishop continued with his ceremony, which was long, to say the least. It was then that Zhang became really angry. She took hold of the book from which the bishop was reading and threw it out the window. Bashing an unsuspecting starling on the head as it flew by. However, the book had an ornate bookmark, which caught on the bishop's sleeve, and as the countess threw the book, it ripped off the gown he was wearing. As the gown tore and fell to the ground, everyone, including Zhang, gasped as it was revealed that the bishop was not in fact a bishop, but Barry in disguise. After a moment of assessing the situation, Zhang became enraged and took hold of Barry and shook him hard. I will be queen tonight, there's nothing you can do. I will be queen despite all you have tried to do. Did you really think you could stop me from becoming queen? Yes! It was
because at that moment that the throne room doors blasted into a million splinters under pressure from Arthur Hardwood Fantasticus. <laughs> Everyone raced inside. And the courtiers were soon tied up by the worms. Put my son down, boomed Mrs Braithwaite at Zhang. Zhang was a little taken aback that this woman, this mere worker, had spoken to her in such a manner. Who do you think you're talking to? She snarled, grabbing hold of Barry's shoulders and shaking him even more violently. You, Mrs Braithwaite continued, pointing her soil-covered finger at the Countess. Your days of nastiness are over, Zhang. Oh, no, they're not, Zhang retorted. Oh, yes, they are, Mrs Braithwaite replied. Oh, no, they're not, the Countess laughed, shaking Barry again. She shook him so hard that his teeth almost chattered right out of his mouth. Oh, for goodness sake, enough is enough. Mrs Braithwaite was exasperated. She rushed forward, kicked Zhang in the shin and grabbed her son before striding back to the middle of the throne room. Are you all right, my darling? Fine, thanks, Mum. Barry assured her. Oh, for goodness sake, Zhang called out, reaching for the crown beside her, placing it on her head and then sitting down on the throne. I've had just about enough of this nonsense from you lot. I am queen now and that's that. Oh, no, you're not, Ermintrude announced as she stepped forwards. And who are you to stop me? Zhang laughed. I have the crown on my head and that's enough for me. But the bishop never finished his ceremony, Ermintrude pointed out. And unless he did so, you aren't the rightful queen of this land. Oh, humbug, Zhang replied. Who cares about what the bishop did and didn't do? I've got the crown, so I'm queen. Not so quickly, Zhang, Ermintrude continued, not allowing the countess to get the better of her. There's something that the fair people of Zambug Munchieville should know. And I'm going to be the one... To tell them. Tell them what? Zhang snorted. The truth about the prince and his quest for the golden shoe of the one-legged lamb. Just you be quiet about that. Ermintrude held up her hand, and suddenly the countess was quiet. The prince was informed of the golden shoe of the one-legged lamb by none other than the countess herself. There was no such one-legged lamb. The Countess made the whole thing up just so she could get her hands on the throne. The crowd just stood there, their jaws dropping as the story began to unfold. Zhang had the prince imprisoned outside of Zumbug Munchieville in a downtown hotel which didn't even have a plasma super wide screen, let alone Wi-Fi with only 25 pounds a week to spend on room service. What a cruel and heartless thing to do. One of the worms cried out. And the prince of royal descent. Another shouted. Yes, Ermintrude continued. Zhang knew that if the prince was away for more than six months, he couldn't return to his kingdom, claim back the throne, and place her in prison as a punishment for her mischievous deeds. Oh, this is ridiculous, Zhang bellowed. This is just hearsay. The prince isn't here, and we know that there is an imposter in the castle. I always suspected you, Ermintrude Mintz, as that imposter, and now I have been proven right. Guards, arrest this woman and lock her in the deepest dungeon you can find. With a hairdo like that, she deserves to be locked away for good. <laughs> Not so fast, Zhang. Ermintrude called out as the guards rushing towards her were stopped by the worms. We need the prince to prove that this story is true. I can bring the prince here right this instant and you can hear from his own lips this very upsetting tale of greed and selfishness. More tricks? How can we believe you? Zhang laughed. Because <laughs> there's more to the story. Ermintrude continued. And I'm going to tell it to you. The prince was imprisoned so that you could take control. Lies! All lies! Zhang blurted. <laughs> Are they? Search what's left of your soul, Countess, and look at the anguish and upset you have caused with your dream of a world addicted to the innocent cabbage. There was a round of applause from the people gathered. It was a good speech, but your plans were put into jeopardy when the cunning prince escaped from the prison you had him committed to. How much more of this is there? Zhang sighed. Not much more, Countess. You'll be happy to know we're reaching the climax. Good. Please get on with it. Well, don't you worry. I'll be finished soon. 
The prince knew that he would be imprisoned again if he returned as himself. So, he returned to the castle disguised as... Ermintrude whipped off her wig and stood there before the Countess in all her glory. The Countess was shocked. Because Ermintrude was not in fact Ermintrude. But the prince! There were gasps from everyone present. Zhang, your days of being wretched to everyone are over. The prince announced, turning to the worms. Please escort this offensive individual to the deepest, darkest dungeon. And keep an eye on her. You've not heard the last of this, Zhang threatened. I'll be back. You can be sure of that. (laughs) Not unless there's a sequel you won't, the prince replied confidently. Zhang was escorted through the relieved crowd and taken away for good. The prince took the royal crown off of Zhang's head as she passed by and placed it on his own. He climbed the steps and sat on the throne, which was most pleased to have someone a little lighter sitting on it. I, King Spondacious, rule us as well as the second. I'm proud to decree that Zumbug Munchieville is now a free land again, and everyone is allowed to return to their farms and not work in the cabbage mine. But what about us? Frankie pointed out. We worms can't return to what we were before. It's a one-way ticket for us. Once we've become huge, we can't go back to being small again. It just doesn't happen. Everyone was quiet for a moment, and then Barry stepped forwards. Worms like being underground. Well, why can't the worms, if they want to, be allowed to work in the cabbage mine? The king thought about this. You're absolutely right, young Barry, he announced. If the worms want to, they can take over the mine and run it as their own. As long as they don't eat all the produce which we need to sell for the good of the country's economy. It was robustly and universally agreed by everyone. Something that doesn't happen very often. Now, Barry, the king mused to himself, your bravery is indeed worthy of some sort of gift. What shall I give you? Barry was silent. He didn't expect this and wondered what glorious gift would be bestowed upon him. I know. King clicked his fingers. You can have a free bus pass. How about that? Barry frowned. Is that it? The king was silent again and then sighed. All right. You can have twice your weight in gold and be the first in line to the throne after me. Barry was much happier with this present, and he, his parents and everyone else were given a great feast. The worms were invited, and there were lots of speeches of thanks for all the help that everyone had given to save the land. However, no one noticed that Lord Snuzzlebucket escaped when the worms took over the castle and had quickly returned home. He was terribly angry about how things had turned out and became so furious that... Do you know what happened next? No? Well, I'll tell you. He went so red with anger that he turned green. Not only did he turn green, after a huge explosion, he turned into the biggest lip-smacking cabbage that you've ever seen. And his wife, who was so tired of him, ate the vegetable right there and then. After a final swallow, she licked her lips, wiped her mouth delicately with a neatly pressed white napkin and, after collecting her thoughts, went off to play tennis with her friend Jo, who has a cracking good backhand. Back at Castle Mint, now that the excitement had died down, Barry and Frankie were finally alone in the great throne room. Everyone else was preparing to get home from the castle at last. There was a lot to do now that they had rescued Zumbug Munchieville, but all agreed that the first thing they needed was a good night's sleep, or probably two, before they got started. Barry had a strange feeling, like all the excitement of the last few days had evaporated. They'd achieved everything they'd set out to do, and just in the nick of time. Frankie noticed the change in Barry's mood and asked, You okay, pal? I guess so, Frankie. I suppose I never thought the excitement of our mission would ever come to an end. I can't wait for the next one. Frankie smiled a kindly smile and realised it was up to her to find a way to say goodbye to her extraordinary young companion. You have to go your way Even though the parting might If you feel deep in
in your heart of hearts You don't want to start The onward journey from this place You won't break apart If you have love, you're strong What do you mean, our party? Well, this can't be goodbye. We've only just started to get to know each other. Oh, Barry, sometimes life just throws folks together to do a job. Then when it's done, they go back to their own lives. It doesn't mean you have to forget all about them. wiped the spaghetti sauce from his mouth and placed some money on the table. I just watched him, not saying a word. There's a story for your kid. He sighed. Write it if you want to. It's all yours. And with that, he walked out of the diner and I never saw him again. A few months later, I heard that he'd been eaten by cabbages on the planet Troil. But these were just rumours. And one can never truly believe what one hears, now can one. The Countess. Book, directed and produced 
by Simon James Collier. Music, lyrics and conducted by Richard Bates. Recording produced and engineered, James Nicholson, with assistance of Paul Gavin. Co-producer, Adam Deschanel. Recorded at Mountview Academy of Theatre Arts, London, July 2019. Graphic design, Clockwork Digital Studios. Cast, Chloe Acom, Emma Huff, Megan Jarvie, Stephen Johnson, Jenny Perry, with John Barr as Arthur. Musicians, Ruth Wybrow, Jonathan Thompson, Connor Smither, Matt Smith, Laura Williams, Connor Fogel, Tom Foskett-Barnes and Hannah Thomas. <laughs>